But I think the big sharp downward movements reflect one thing. We've been saying since we launched Fortune and Freedom, don't touch the tech sector, all right? Don't go near it. It's hugely overvalued. Each year that goes by, it gets more and more bubbly. Yes, of course, there are some fantastic tech companies that will come through all of this and do very, very well, but the NASDAQ's grossly overvalued. And I do see these setbacks as something of a validation for that, because when things are trading at multiples uh, that are almost beyond comprehension, you know, when they set back, you know, it may be 20% one day and 20% the next day and 20% the day after, and, and everyone's forgotten something, which is. Hello and welcome to This Week in Review with Nigel Farage. Nigel, there's been a bit of news in the UK mortgage market. Lloyds Bank has launched the cheapest ever 10-year fixed mortgage at a rate of 1.66%. That's 1.66% to all of those of you who borrowed in the 80s or the 70s. Do you think this is a sign of a, a housing bubble that we've sort of peaked in terms of how cheap mortgages can get? Yeah, I mean, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, given everything that we're seeing, you know, with, with, with central banks all over the world beginning to put rates up a little bit, with inflation, uh, despite all the doubters uh, here to stay for some time, I would have thought, it does seem astonishing that they're offering a mortgage like that. Almost like they're desperate. They're desperate to lend money and sell houses. Um, uh, but have, having said that, of course, Nick, it is in some ways rather attractive, isn't it? But you think to yourself, gosh, you know, we've seen house prices rocket during the pandemic. Um, and outside of London, uh, the rate of rise has been truly astonishing. I mean, particularly on our coastal locations, areas like that. I thought the London market was going to fall sharply. Even that doesn't seem to have done at this moment in time with yet more foreign money probably hot money, some of it, uh, coming into that market. So, yeah, it, everything does feel a bit toppy, I think, on house prices. And maybe this is just a symptom of that. Yeah, it seems like central banks were able to forestall any sort of crisis from the pandemic in that, especially the, the uh, property market, but also the stock market to some extent. But the idea that that can happen without some sort of consequence later on is probably going to be flawed. And, and that flaw should theoretically be that when interest rates do go back up to more reasonable levels, then all of these asset prices will correct. But so far, and, and this mortgage story is the latest example, it seems like banks are not even worried about inflation or, or even interest rates having to rise. They seem to be gambling almost that this inflation and interest rates, uh, interest rate hike story is is even going to happen. But then you know the the narrative from those that thought we were wrong a year ago, namely that it wasn't going to happen, it would only be transitory if it did. The narrative from those people now is that by the end of 2022, uh, we're going to see lower inflation, and, and I mean that is now pretty much the standard view, you know, right across these people and right across. Uh, the establishment, and, and very much the view is that fuel prices will, you know, fuel prices will go lower because these prices will lead to increases in production. But of course, as we know, you know, there's more than one cause of inflation, um, and and monetary inflation to do with the money supply. You know, I think we both think that actually probably hasn't fully kicked in yet. So look, you know, I mean, the fact that the fact that what we're saying here um, is against the mainstream consensus doesn't worry me one jot. Yeah, it's interesting that these big banks and financials are betting on it. I think that's what makes this so exciting. But they've had so many mistakes in their past. One of the readers actually emailed in, and we didn't get permission to, to name him or to ask his question word for word. But the gist of it was that he was very angry that we talk about inflation as being sort of something that continues. And his point was that even if it's just a one-off, you know, 5% inflation for two years in a row, that's a huge, you know, pain in the for, for a lot of people who really suffer from that who lose a huge chunk of their wealth and his point was that you know the outrage should still already be there given how much inflation has hit and how low interest rates are do you agree with that well he's not wrong is he in saying that it's just that we think it might last a bit longer than that that's all so you know i mean you know whoever you are we're not picking a fight with you we don't disagree with your point we just have a slight sense hunch a feel uh, that it could be a bit worse than you're expecting. 
Let's and it could be a she, by the way. We we deal in uh, in initials, not full names. So if 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 I've got that one wrong, my apologies. Let's move on to tech stocks. Um, there's been a huge rout in Facebook. Um, I think it was overnight or two days ago. Once once uh, people are viewing this, and a couple of the other tech stocks have crashed as well. Spot <coughs> excuse me, Spotify being one example. There's a bit of a go woke, go broke story here. I think which I know you'll you'll enjoy. Well, Spotify in particular. I mean, Joe Rogan who, you know, has developed the most astonishing podcast in America. I mean, forget CNN, forget, you know, all those, all, I mean, you know, Rogan, some of these podcasts get millions of views. Now, now he interviewed a guy called Robert Malone the other day, who, by the way, I've had on with me on GB News. And Malone has spent 40 years in vaccine development um, and was one of the co-inventors of the current mRNA uh, vaccine. And, you know, Malone is just saying, whoa, let's just be a bit cautious about this. You know, we shouldn't really be injecting kids. Uh, we shouldn't be repeatedly injecting people. Um, but, of course, the establishment view is that the more times we inject everybody, the better it's all going to be. Um, and so you've had, you know, quite well-known pop artists take their music off Spotify. Um, and, yeah, you know, the more uh, just because Rogan wants to allow free speech, on his Spotify podcast and include all views, uh, the Woke Brigade have done Spotify a huge amount of damage. Equally with Facebook, I mean, look, what we do know is that the younger generations are not so Facebook orientated. You know, TikTok, et cetera, is where these young people are. Um, but I think the big sharp downward movements reflect one thing. We've been saying since we launched Fortune and Freedom, don't touch the tech sector, all right? Don't go near it. It's hugely overvalued. Each year that goes by, it gets more and more bubbly. Yes, of course, there are some fantastic tech companies that will come through all of this and do very, very well. But the Nasdaq's grossly overvalued. And I do see these setbacks as something of a validation for that, because when things are trading at multiples uh, that are almost beyond comprehension, you know, when they set back, you know, it may be 20 percent one day and 20 percent the next day and 20 percent the day after. And, and everyone's forgotten something, which is that the dot-com crash, which happened in 2001, saw the NASDAQ fall from peak to low point 84%. All forgotten, all forgotten, but we haven't forgotten it. Um, and that's why we've gone on recommending solid, safe, good companies in the right sectors. Um, let's move on to the po political story with, with Boris. It looks like he'll uh, f live to fight another scandal, as I see it. What's your take? No, he's finished. It's just a matter of time. Uh, this is the death by a thousand cuts. Every day that goes by, we get, you know, another backbench MP say they've lost support. Um, Michael Gove this week unveiled the levelling up agenda. Uh, any viewers uh, that understand what it's about, please let me know because I've spent hours studying it. I'm none the wiser, other than it's another do sort of dose of state socialism. Um, and and this isn't just about party gate. We've got to get a Bit, a bit more of a take on this. You know, he's not even showing the country the benefits of Brexit or the potential benefits of Brexit. The obvious thing to do is to take the 5% off, the 5% VAT off energy bills. No, no, no. What they're going to do is rebate people through council tax. It'll probably cost more to administer than it will actually save anybody. Um, so the whole conservative movement in Britain has utterly lost its way under Boris Johnson, uh, and whether it's his desire that if, that if Ukraine wants to join NATO, they can, uh, to his spending policies and plans, you realise this guy actually is, you know, a metropolitan elite globalist, and Brexit was just a convenient career advancement. And I'm sorry if that sounds a bit harsh to some, but I genuinely believe that to be the case. It seemed to me for a while that he had started to release a few policies and started to make some moves then on, on actual Brexit benefits. Uh, and it seemed to be the scandals that pushed him over the edge into making these announcements each time. So I was yeah. getting quite excited thinking, well, maybe he's actually going to do something now because he's yeah. in such a tight spot. But, uh, but I'll take your scepticism on if board as well. Let me tell you this. If he actually was sincere and genuine about supply side reform, about increased competitiveness for business, particularly small business, then Lord Frost would not have resigned. You know, Lord Frost was our chief negotiator. Lord Frost actually believes in the Brexit package rather than having used it as, as, as a step for career advancement. And if 
and if 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 Frost thought there was going to be some follow through on this, he would have stayed. What happens now in a uh, uh, a challenge for the the leader of of the Conservative Party and in in elections in the next few years, if Brexit feels settled and yet there is the threat of not taking advantage of it, do you think that the because it seems that Brexit was what got Boris over the line. Now, what's what now that issue is, is well, is it gone? And if it isn't, or if it is, then then what becomes the new dividing line? So Keir Starmer has taken the Labour Party back towards a social democrat position. You know, very much back towards a Blairite kind of Labour Party. And in that, you know, he doesn't frighten the pants off the middle classes. After all, he's now saying we're the low tax party, and you couldn't invent some of this stuff. Um, and the battle. When the succession battle comes, and my guess is that'll be this summer, there'll be an eight week campaign for who succeeds Boris Johnson. And that will be partly about personality, but I think actually it'll be about something bigger. It will be, does the Conservative Party themselves stay in the Social Democrat center, very close to Starmer on virtually everything, or are we going to go to, you know, a more radical, and I use that word not in a frightening sense, but in, a, in, a, in an Oxford English dictionary sense, a more radical direction. And actually, this is the battle the Conservative Party has had within itself for 200 years. You know, are you for the Corn Laws Act or do you want to free us up from it? Uh, you know, where do you stand on imperial preference? Where do you stand on the appeasement of Nazi Germany? Where do you stand on, uh, on, on Brexit? And these are the great battles. And you always, on the one hand, in the Conservative Party, have the landowners and the big businesses and the great families, and they want no change whatsoever. You know, keep it pretty much everything as it is. And then you get the radicals. That's when you get the Thatchers and people like that who say, hey, this ain't working. You know, we need to do something because we believe in free markets. We don't think the state actually does these things terribly well. So there's going to be, a, I, I, I honestly can see a sort of battle of the soul, if you like, for conservatism in Britain happening this year. And of course, I know which side I want to win. Let's move on to Ukraine. <laughs> I don't know about us, which side you want to win there. <laughs> But um, it seems to me well, that no, there's I been. Mean, a... I mean, look, Dick. You know, I mean, you know, I'm big enough and ugly enough to remember um, the 1970s, to remember very high tax burdens, to remember masses of nationalised state industries all losing money, all grossly inefficient. Um, and I've seen the free market. Uh, I've seen how it works. I understand that in a, in a civilised society, some get hurt, but overall, society becomes richer and better off. So no, no. I mean, I know exactly where I stand. Let's move on to Ukraine. There's been a, a, a bit of a de-escalation, it seems to me, um, at least on the Western side. I'm not so sure the Russians were particularly concerned in the first place. Is, is that your take as well? Well, the Russians are having a great time. I mean, without, without a single soldier entering Ukraine, the European Union's tearing itself to pieces. Um, Sleepy Joe doesn't look like really the leader of NATO. Um, and Boris is all over the place. In fact, he couldn't even speak to Putin because he was defending Partygate in the House of Commons. So, I mean, Putin's, Putin's playing a blinder here in terms of the West looking more divided on this stuff than it has done for decades. Um, I, I could be wrong, but I don't think Putin is going to invade. I think this is all a massive game of bluff. Um, it's exposed Germany. It's exposed the green agenda. The green agenda in Germany, the hard left green agenda in Germany, has now left Germany totally in Putin's hands. He can close down the car industry tomorrow. Um, and that's one of the knock-on effects, actually, for this debate that'll happen in the Tories this year. If we go for net zero, and we're happy to export all our manufacturing industries, and we're happy to go on importing gas, oil, even electricity under pipelines from France, uh, we, have, we, we face the risk of becoming dependent upon others in the way that Germany has. So we'll see, and I'll finish with one last thought on this. Um, and it's something I've believed for 30 years. Ever since the Berlin Wall came down, I fully understand why countries that had lived under the Soviet Union wanted to get away, wanted to grab out to the West. And for them, EU membership, NATO membership was very attractive. I completely understand that. 
But from a geopolitical standpoint, what we seem to have forgotten is that all through history, Moscow has always been more frightened of us than we have of Moscow. And that was true all through the Cold War. And unless you understand the historic concept of buffer states, if you want to expand your organizations up to the Russian border, uh, they're paranoid and they view this as an aggressive act. And I find it stunning, given the stand up off we've currently got, that both Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State in Washington, and Boris Johnson are both saying to Ukraine, if you want to join NATO, come on in, the water's lovely. Actually, they should be saying the opposite, that NATO has expanded as far as it can and put the ball back in Putin's court. Say, look, Vladimir, you're saying all these things. Here we are, we're, we're showing you. We don't want to encroach your borders anymore. And yet they won't do it. And as I felt this way for 30 years, uh, that somehow the globalists just want to build these empires that go on expanding. It's one of those examples of politicians who are in the crisis themselves, poking the bear in order to get a bit of nationalist fervor going. Nigel, thanks very much for joining us. And everyone at home, thanks for joining us as well.